It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turning your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 will begin the battle against two areas of legalism. Two battles against legalism. The first battle, salvation by works. Second battle, spirituality by works. Now, under salvation by works, there's the nine uh, points we need to take. Salvation by works. Two battles against legalism. Salvation by works. Spirituality by works. Nine points under salvation by works. Salvation by works always adds something to believe. Now, these nine are not the only things, but are some of the things. First of all, believe and repent. That's a big one. Believe and repent. It's just believe. We've noted that. And repent means to change your mind. Believe and repent. Today we think it means to feel sorry for your sins. That's not part of it. Simply faith alone in Christ alone. Secondly, believe and confess. No confession is needed. Simply believe in Christ. Confession is post-salvation, not pre-salvation. Believe and confess. Thirdly, believe and be baptized. Believe and be baptized. You don't have to be baptized for salvation. Believe and be baptized. Fourth, believe in full surrender. Surrender yourself to Christ. Believe in full surrender to Christ. Not part of it. Some of you look confused as if you've never heard it. It's out there. Believe and surrender yourself to Christ. Not part of it. Simple faith alone in Christ alone. Believe and join a church. That's not part of it. Catholics believe you're not saved until you join the Catholic Church. Not part of salvation. You don't have to believe and join a church. Simple faith alone in Christ alone. The next one, believe and beg God to save you. God is not impressed with begging. Simple faith alone in Christ alone. Next one. You have to believe and give up something. That's a big one today. Give up a bad habit. Change your lifestyle. Believe and change lifestyle. Believe and give up something. Not part of salvation. Simple faith alone in Christ alone and Paul's going to attack this. Believe and be circumcised. That's one Paul will attack directly. Believe and be circumcised. Or believe and keep the law, and Paul will attack that directly as well. Now these are just some examples. Anything that you add to faith alone in Christ alone is a work, and it's something that Paul would attack. It's something that I will attack. It's not part of the Bible. It's not part of the Bible. I'm not going to teach it. Anything where you add something to faith is not allowed. And if you add anything to faith, you're not saved. There are many people across this country who think they're saved, but they're not. They've added something to faith. And as we've noted from Romans, every time you add something to faith, it's credit to you, not for righteousness, but for debt. And you get further and further in debt, you're digging yourself a hole. Simple faith alone in Christ alone. Then there's spirituality by works. Several things related to spirituality by works. Tearing and fasting. You're spiritual if you fast. You're spiritual if you tarry. You say, what's tarrying? I don't know, but people say it. Tarrying and fasting. And they say it because it's part of Old English. They don't know what it means, and I don't know what it means. And they say, you must tarry. You must fast. And that will make you spiritual. Spiritual. And that is incorrect. Some people think they're spiritual if they get into a closet and pray. And that's not spirituality. Some people think they're spiritual if they follow taboos, certain taboos created by man. And that's not spirituality, all of which is attacked by Paul. Asceticism. 
Asceticism. What's asceticism? Asceticism is when you give up something pleasurable or something else for spirituality. Some people give up watching movies. Some people give up wearing shorts. Some people give up wearing... Uh, women give up wearing pants and high heels. Give up wearing makeup. That's asceticism. That's not spirituality. That's stupidity. Then we have spirituality by ecstatics. What's that? Spirituality by emotion. You're spiritual if you feel spiritual. You're spiritual if you shout and raise your hand toward heaven. That's not spirituality. That's also stupid. Some people say you're spiritual if you pray. Prayer is not spirituality. Prayer is a result of spirituality. It is not a means of spirituality. Prayer is a result of spirituality. If you're spiritual, you can pray and your prayers will be heard. If you're not filled with the Spirit and you pray, the prayer bounces around in your head and goes no higher than the ceiling. God doesn't hear such prayers. Prayer is a result, not a means of spirituality. Another one is yieldedness. Yieldedness. Some of you look confused. It's in the, it's in the King James. If you've been to any uh, King James only Baptist church, you know exactly what I'm saying. Yield to the Lord, etc. Yieldedness. I can't believe some of you haven't heard this. You are very sheltered. Especially you. You have to have heard that before. Yield. Well, anybody that's been in those religions, they know right off. They don't even know what it means, but you got to do it. you got to yield, brother. Yield, brother, yield. Never heard that? Yield, brother. I'm glad you're confused because it's confusing and nobody knows what it means. Even they don't know what it means, they, but they associate it with spirituality. No spirituality attached to that. You better thank God you are so sheltered. And then another one, crucifying self. Crucify self. Never heard that either, huh? Crucify self. Spirituality by works. Crucify self. It means give up certain things. Crucify self. Crucifying self. Now everything in God's plan is not based on human merit. So that throws out human works. It throws out salvation by works. It throws out spirituality by, work, by works. Everything in God's plan is not based on human merit. You can't please God by what you do. Whether it be the salvation phase, you can't save yourself, or spirituality phase, you can't make yourself spiritual by energy of the flesh. You can't make yourself spiritual by yielding, by prayer, by ecstatics, by asceticism, by tabooism, by getting into a closet, by tarrying, by fasting. None of that results in spirituality. It results in stupidity. So uh, one thing that's interesting is you have the salvation phase of life. Believe in Christ and you'll be saved. Then you have the spirituality phase they add works to those two phases. But there's also another phase, the eternal phase. That's one with that they really haven't been able to attach works to. When you're face to face with the Lord, they kind of find it hard to have you working in heaven for the Lord. Now, they don't mention that. It's kind of hard to think about it. But that just shows how stupid they are. So we do not earn or deserve anything from God. We do not deserve anything from God. And by the way, I say they're stupid and I mean it. And so does the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3. I don't know if it says it in the King James or not, but he, he calls the Galatians stupid about 50 different times. Stupid Galatians. Well, stupid Baptist. Stupid Methodist. Stupid denominations adding things for salvation, adding things to spirituality. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Get used to it. Now, Galatians 2.1. Then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem again with Barnabas, taking Titus along too. We'll note a lot about this verse. Then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem again with Barnabas, taking Titus along too. Now remember, Paul had spent uh, 12 to 13 years in a desert. 
And then after 14 years, he had a limited ministry. So that equals over, what, 25 years. 25 years, the Apostle Paul, not even recognized, barely known. 25 to 27 years after his salvation, barely known. Now his ministry is about to take off. So Paul went up to Jerusalem as a delegate of Antioch. And he's serving as a very lim- on a very limited basis in Ani- excuse me, Antioch. Now, 14 years after the visit to Jerusalem mentioned above in 118, Paul and Barnabas go to the Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council is recorded in Acts 15. Turn in your Bibles to Acts 15. They take Titus along as well, and Titus is an uncircumcised Gentile. Acts 15 is actually a recording of this visit. There's some behind-the-things events that occur that Acts 15 does not document, but Galatians does. And this is what's going to be interesting. We're going to get to see behind the scenes of this great council. And that's when they get together, argue, and hash some things out and come up with a uh, document. And a lot of things regarding this document are left out. Very rarely in public record do they put everything in it. The public record of Congress... Uh, Sometimes somebody in Congress might get mad and say something that's a bit angry. They strike it from public record. And if you were to read the public record, you wouldn't see it all. You wouldn't know what really happened. But behind the scenes in Congress, you would see that someone was called a jackass. And you would see somebody else was called this and that and the other. Same thing's occurring here. So in Acts 15, we have the council at Jerusalem. Now some men doubt... Some men came down from Judea, and these are legalists, to Antioch, and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. What's that, legalism or grace? That's legalism. So some men came down from Judea. Why did Paul go up to this Jerusalem council? Because he had people coming down from Judea saying, you're not saved unless you're circumcised. You're not saved unless you follow the law. We have the same people today. You're not saved unless you invite Christ into your heart. You're not saved unless you walk forward. You're not saved unless you've committed yourself to the Lord. You're not saved because you had a head belief and not a heart belief. You're not saved because of this, that, and the other. Same thing occurs today. Same thing happened then. And the people who say that today are just as stupid as the Galatians were back then. And I mean stupid. So this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. Sharp dispute means they had a brawl. Some of you like brawls. Well, here's Paul having a doctrinal brawl with somebody. And this is a legitimate brawl. He's going to stand up for something significant, doctrine. So this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. It's kind of soft. They had an all-out argument. They didn't beat each other up, but they had a knock-down, drag-out argument. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Now, Paul and Barnabas are grace believers, and they're going to challenge this whole group of people who've been coming down saying, you must be saved by circumcision, you must be saved by following the law. Now, if someone starts teaching false doctrine, you've got to tell them to sit down. You've got to tell them to sit down and shut up. You're messing with my flock. And that's what Paul had to do. These legalists were messing with his flock, so he had to get tough. And he had to say, here are idiots teaching false doctrine. And the reason is very simple. You get one idiot infiltrating a church and teaching false doctrine, it takes months to straighten it out. And the same thing happened with Paul. One idiot walked in and started confusing the people, and it took months for Paul to straighten it out. But he had to straighten it out. And to straighten it out, he had to get tough. And no doubt some of these people had to leave, as we will note. So you can't have an assistant pastor and you can't have all these other people getting up and speaking because one little false doctrine that comes out of the mouth of one person can confuse a whole congregation for months. The pastor can teach correct doctrine for years, have one guest speaker get up and give one bit of false doctrine and the people are confused and the pastor has to beat it back out of them. It's that serious. And that's why Paul gets so tough. 
Why do I get tough? Why does Paul get tough? This legalism is a cancer, that's why. And if you were to get cancer, are you just going to uh, play around with it? Are you going to fry it with some chemo? You're going to fry it with chemo or die. So it's my job as a pastor, just it was the Apostle Paul's job, that when he spotted legalism, to fry it. Clear it out. So what if people were offended? They needed to be. And they needed to get out. And we will note all of this. So the church sent them on their way. And as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made, made all the brothers very glad, that is, all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the parties of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met to consider this question. And after much disputing, even among the apostles, Peter got up and addressed them. Peter, this is uh, following Peter's uh, pretentiousness. I'm self-appointed leader. I will address them. In this case, he's right on the money. It's rare that Peter's right on the money. In this case, he is. We will note uh, tomorrow where Peter is not on the money and where Peter is going to be excoriated personally by Paul in front of everyone. Say, don't get personal. Paul got personal. A pastor has a right to get personal, and so does an apostle. And so will the apostle Paul get very, very, very personal. And a pastor has a right to get personal in terms of con commendation and saying, wow, you are very positive, or in condemnation, wow, you are not. And we will note that. If you think otherwise, you're an idiot like the Galatians. So the apostles and elders met to consider this question. And after much disputing, even among the apostles, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Note what Peter says. Simple belief. Faith alone in Christ alone. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. That's the Gentile Pentecost. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Faith. Faith alone in Christ alone. Not by circumcision, not by following the law, and not by all the other things man comes up with. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear. In other words, nobody's ever followed the Mosaic Law perfectly. I haven't, you haven't, neither have your fathers. So why are you putting on the yoke of this Mosaic Law on people when you couldn't even follow it? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved, just as they are. How were they saved? By grace. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When they finished, James spoke up. Now James is the leader of the Jerusalem church. He's a legalist. He's about to go off the deep end. And he will die the sin face to face with death. Now what he starts off saying, now James is a man pleaser. Now he's recognizing through the ministry of Paul and Barnabas because Paul and Barnabas have been very straight with them and Paul and Barnabas have said faith alone in Christ alone, James, you should know that. James, half-brother of Jesus Christ, you should know you only have to believe in your half-brother to be saved. <laughs> but he didn't know that. And he was learning something from this as we will note. But as soon as Paul leaves, he's going to go right back deep, even deeper into legalism. And we note that James is a man-pleaser because he's coming up with a compromise. What is this all about, not eating meat and all that? It's a compromise. So when they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Now, James is the leader of the Jerusalem church, and they've had this big conference, and he's going to have to say something about it. And he's going to have to come up with a policy. And instead of just getting up and saying, Brothers, you're a bunch of legalists, 
It's faith alone and Christ alone. You've been led astray. I've been led astray. We need to follow what Paul and Barnabas are saying. We need to have faith alone and Christ alone, and that's it. Instead of doing that, he's going to come up with a compromise. Brothers, listen to me. Simon. Now, this is something interesting. Simon is Peter. Simon is Peter. But James uses his Jewish name. Peter is now Peter. His name has been changed. Why does James use Simon, his Jewish name? Because James is still stuck in the Jewish religion. Simon, Jewish name for Peter, has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. So James starts out saying, look, we need to agree with them right now. We've got to agree with these people. We've got to agree with Paul and Barnabas now because it makes too much sense. And so he comes up with a verse from the Old Testament. As it is written, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the remnant of men may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. So he's making it clear that, yes, Gentiles are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. He can't disagree with that part of it. But now here comes the compromise. And actually what uh, James is doing right here is he's saying, Paul and Barnabas, I'm going to scratch your back on this one. Paul and Barnabas, I'm going to accept it up to the point that yes, Gentiles are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. I will accept it and I'll scratch your back in that way. But also, Paul and Barnabas, you need to scratch my back and we will note this. It is my judgment, therefore, notice it is James' judgment. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them Here's the compromise. Telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and that, of course, is obvious, from the meat of strangled animals and from blood. You know what the Jehovah's Witnesses do with that? They say, oh, we have to abstain from blood. We cannot have blood transfusions but they're taking a compromise of legalism and turning it into, uh, in, into um, a statement of doctrine. This, you see, Luke wrote Acts, and he just wrote it as a thing, events, events that occurred. This is not part of what we should follow. These are just events that occurred. We can actually eat meat that was offered to an idol. Paul actually brings that out in Colossians. We can eat meat if it was offered to an idol. For example, if you were to go to India... And, well, they don't really eat meat, they eat chicken, but if a chicken was offered to an idol in India, you could eat that chicken, nothing wrong with it. You don't even believe that anyway, so what's it matter? And Paul clears this up, but here's the compromise. He says, Paul, Barnabas, yes, you're, the Gentiles are saved by faith alone and Christ alone, but let's add some works in the spirituality realm. Telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, which is obvious, and of course what everyone should abstain from. But notice James, he's a legalist. First thing that pops into his mind is sexual immorality. Not gossip, maligning, and judging. James is going way, way outside of the realm of grace. From the meat of strangled animals and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. So freaking what? That's what he's saying. Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. What he's doing is saying, all right, they don't have to follow the Mosaic law. But you listen here, Paul. He's kind of coming down on Paul. He could not deny the doctrine of it. But he's still going to have a streak of legalism in him and he's going to say, you listen here, Paul. Moses has been taught in the synagogues from the beginning. And now you're saying they don't have to follow the Mosaic law. Well, that's fine what you're saying, but they better abstain from this, that, and the other. And they better abstain from this and that. A little yeast leavens a whole loaf. And here's James, still in his legalism, trying to leaven the whole loaf. 
Now, he accepted faith alone in Christ alone. At this point, he had to. But when it comes to the Word of God, there is no compromise. When it comes to the Word of God, there is no compromise. That's why I don't care if some days you have to gnash your teeth and you don't like what you're hearing. I just don't care. Because when it comes to the Word of God, there is no compromise. And here's James making a compromise. And by the way, the Apostle Paul at one point is going to be very influenced by James. He should have separated from James right there. He's not going to. And in fact, there's going to be a separation clause later on that we will note. It's going to say, Paul, you go to the Gentiles. Us Jews will stay to ourselves. And if Paul would have remained in that setting, he wouldn't have gotten into trouble. You, know, you see, James himself got so sick of all the trouble with Paul, he said, let's separate basically. And if Paul would have said, all right, I want to separate and keep your people here and I'll just teach them my grace-oriented people and we'll be fine. And they would have been. But then one day Paul's going to get emotional and say, I'm going back to Jerusalem. I'm going to straighten these people out and then they're going to about kill him. Again, when it comes to the Word of God, there is no compromise. A lot of people want a sweet pastor a sweet, mealy-mouthed pastor, somebody who's nice all the time, usually so the women can run roughshod right over him. And men, men with women's souls. And, and usually women like that also have husbands they can run right over. And that's what they like. Control, control, control. Well, forget that. When it comes to the Word of God, there is no place for compromise. And you say, where do you get this about women? First and Second Timothy. Paul had to straighten out Timothy on that because the women, Timothy was a sweet type pastor. And he was teaching doctrine correctly, but he didn't have enough cojones to just stand up and not... Well, he never compromised. He just didn't have a way to put it across in terms where they knew who was in charge and they knew what doctrine they needed to follow. Now let's look at this behind-the-scene activity. What we just noted in Acts 15 was the actual meeting and the official documentation of this meeting. Now in Galatians 2.1 and following, we get behind the scenes. This is behind the scenes. The behind the scene activity of the Jerusalem Council. And what this does for you is now you're a fly on the wall. That's how you can think of it. You see, the only thing that uh, James would want to come out would be the official documentation that Luke wrote. Luke was a doctor. And James would have been fine with this official documentation, but Paul's going to let us be a fly on the wall and see what really went on behind the scenes. Then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem again with Barnabas, taking Titus along too. Now the Greek word referring to take, taking Titus along too means deliberately. Paul deliberately took Titus along. And you say, why? Titus was a Gentile and uncircumcised. And you say, well, that means Paul was looking for a fight. You better believe he was looking for a fight. And, and he was in fellowship and doing it, and in fact, it was in accordance with God's will that he take Titus. This was to make an issue out of it. And so he said, all right, I'm going to take Titus along with me too to this conference. And I'm going to do it on purpose, deliberately, because I'm ready to straighten these people out. But why? Why can he do this? Why can he say, I'm going to go up here and straighten these people out? Because they've been bothering him. He didn't bother them. They're the ones who've been coming down into his church, uh, coming down and uh, stepping on his property and telling him how it should be. So he's going to go up there to the leaders and he's going to take Titus along and he's going to make a scene. So 14 years after his visit to Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas go to the Jerusalem council as we just noted in Acts 15. And he's going to take Titus along. And what's going to happen is uh, Titus is going to be there and, there and some of the people are going to come up and say, I notice Titus is a Gentile. Is he circumcised? Legalists are always nosy and gossips. Is he circumcised? Who cares? But he brought him along for that purpose. And Paul would say, no, he's not circumcised. 
But Titus is saved, but he's not circumcised. And yet the same thing occurs today. Legalist walks into a grace church, they will say, did you commit yourself to the Lord? I know that pastor said just believe, but did you really commit yourself to the Lord? And legalisms creep, and that's when legalists creep in. And I guarantee you, a legalist creeps in like that, I'll be just like Paul. Just like him. I won't put up with it. And so they all, they're, they're pushy, very pushy. Did you repent at the altar? You see, they said, did you get circumcised? Today it would be, did you repent at the altar? Did you cry? Did you, do you feel saved now? Uh, did you walk forward? Did you raise your hand? Did you confess Christ with your mouth publicly? And they're going to add all of these things to faith alone. So Titus was actually taken along as proof that God saves people whether circumcised or not. So here's Titus saved an uncircumcised Gentile and proof and brought along on purpose. I think it's funny. You probably don't, but I think it's hilarious. Galatians 2.2. 2. Now in Galatians 2.2, 2, this shows that not only did Paul take him along deliberately, but when he took him along deliberately, it wasn't out of the old sin nature. It was perfectly, he was perfectly filled with God the Holy Spirit, and it was God the Holy Spirit himself who wanted Paul to take Titus along. I went there, and this is corrected translation, I went there according to the standard of revelation. I went there according to the standard of revelation. And what's that mean? He went there according to God's will. And he brought someone along to make a personal issue out of someone as a teaching tool. And every apostle and every pastor has a right to do so. I went there according to the standard of revelation of God's will and communicated the gospel to them, and this is dative of advantage, to their advantage, that I keep on a preaching among the Gentiles. This is linear action start, and he's saying I'm going to keep on preaching to the Gentiles and nobody's going to stop me. But I did so only privately with the influential people so that I did not or had not run in vain. He did so only with influential people so that he had not or did not run in vain. Now he's going to bring up Titus along with him. And he's going to go up to the influential people such as Peter, James, and John. And he's going to go to them in private and speak to them personally. And what he's going to tell them is that Christ is the issue in salvation. It's Sin is not the issue in salvation. Christ is. Circumcision is not the issue in salvation. Christ is. The Mosaic law is not the issue in salvation. Christ is. He's going to make it clear and he's going to hammer it straight to the leaders. Now you've got to understand something. You, you know of Apostle Paul as this great apostle, but at this point he is relatively unknown. This man is the leader of a very small church, very small church, relatively unknown and he's going to go up to the leaders of the Jerusalem church and they probably have a thousand plus members maybe a thousand to ten thousand members and at their peak they'll have about ten thousand legalistic members and you've got to understand here's Paul relatively unknown going up to James who's the leader of the Jerusalem church he's going to chew him out and the tendency would be who are you you, you, you have this itty-bitty church. You're coming up to me telling me how I should preach? That would be their tendency. But Paul is going to so slam them into the ground. He's going to, you see, legalism's vicious. And the only way to deal with it is to be more vicious than legalism. That is in your speech. Now, you're, doing, you're teaching doctrine, but you're making it known you're not going to be pushed around. And that's what Paul's going to do. Here's Paul. Note Paul. Short bald-headed, big nose, high squeaky voice, and pot belly. And he has a message and he's going to go up to these leaders and give it to them. That's called spiritual self-esteem. He doesn't care. He is not a man pleaser. And we'll note this in Acts later on because he gets himself into so much trouble. And you'd say, no wonder the man got beat up. Yeah, no wonder. But he didn't care. He just did not care. Tough man, very tough. 
And that's what made him one of the great, the greatest apostle. I went there according to the standard of revelation of God's will and communicated the gospel to them to their advantage that I keep on preaching among the Gentiles. So he went privately, therefore, with influential people. And in this private conference, he made the issue clear concerning salvation once again, and that's in Acts 15. And he did it privately because he did not want to get in a public argument amongst the church and the congregation. And the reason is quite clear. If he would have went into this church and just started during the church service arguing with the pastors, that would be wrong. He went straight to the pastor, straight to the leaders. If he would have stood up during a church service and said, that's the stupidest stuff I ever heard, he would have been wrong. He would have been going against the authority. Even though that pastor would have been way out, as James would have been, he would have been wrong to stand up and make an issue in front of the congregation. Besides, it wouldn't have worked. The congregation would have went with personalities. And I guarantee you, personalities, he would have, the congregation would have went with James. They wouldn't have liked Paul at all. They would have said, who is this guy standing up? I don't even know who this guy is. Hey, isn't he the guy who used to go around and kill Christians? Why are we listening to him? So he went privately straight to the leaders, straight to the pastor. And Paul did this as an apostle himself. So he did it privately so as not to split the Jerusalem church, and he did, he did it privately so as not to cause problems in the congregation. And that's all what it would have done, and he knew that. Now there's some things that should be dealt with in private. There are other things that should be dealt with in public, as we will note. In this case... Paul is going to deal with this situation privately. But we will note when it comes to Peter, he's going to deal with Peter publicly, and there's a reason why. Peter has approbation lust out the wazoo. And so the worst thing to happen to Peter is to be excoriated publicly so that others could see him get excoriated. And uh, Peter had a tent. He just wanted to get along with everybody. And he had that type of personality. You'd, we'd all probably like Peter. But because Peter always wanted to get along with people, he decided he was going to get along with the legalists. And why? Because they were so vicious and pushy. And the only way to get along with the legalists is to follow in their footsteps, to follow the leader. And the legalist wants to be the leader. They are pushy. They are nosy. And Peter didn't want any trouble, so he followed them. And because of that, as we will note tomorrow, Peter is going to get his butt chewed out and proper and in public. In this case, it was not done in public. Now in 2.3, Galatians 2.3, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, although he was a Greek. Again, yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, although he was a Greek, meaning Gentile. Now, what does it mean when it says, yet not even Titus who was with me was compelled? It means they had come up to him and bothered him. And they said, Titus, have you been circumcised? Or they went to Paul first, and they said, Paul, we noticed Titus with you. Is it true he's not circumcised? Is it true he's a Gentile and has not been circumcised? And then they would say, Paul... I, re I remember you were a leader in the uh, religious zealotry. You were a leader and you knew all the Mosaic law. Are you now abandoning the Mosaic law? And Paul would say, you're damn right I am. That's exactly what Paul would say. And so this is what he says. Yet not even Titus who was with me was compelled. They couldn't compel Titus. They tried. They tried to say, Titus, get circumcised. And Paul said, no way. By grace you're saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works. And if Titus circumcises himself, he'll be no more saved than he is right now. He really got laid it on the line with him. Now in Galatians 2, 4. Now this matter arose because of the false brothers who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we keep having in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. Again, the corrected translation. Uh, what I could do, I've been thinking about whether to do this or not, is to read the King James Version and then give you the corrected version. But there's so many versions of the Bible out today that uh, 
I don't know how many of you King, use King James or NSAB or NIV, so I'll just give you the corrected uh, translation. So now this matter arose because of the false brothers who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we keep having in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. So let's look at this word slipped. The word slipped in Greek drama referred to a minor actor who would slip in to the scene. The word slip in Greek drama refers to a minor actor who would sneak into a scene. Now this minor actor would have a role in which he would not speak. He would just show up and be part of the background and never had a speaking part. So they would slip in as minor people. They are minor people. They are gnats. They are mosquitoes who have slipped into your house and are going to bite you. That's what it means. To spy. Now, spy is Greek for secretly infiltrating a city to bring it down. In this case, they have secretly infiltrated Paul's ministry to bring it down. They want to bring down Paul's ministry of grace. Then we have to spy out our freedom. You could also translate it liberty. And where does liberty start? You should know that answer. Liberty starts at the cross. Liberty starts at the cross. We are no longer under bondage when you believe in Christ. You are freed from the slave market of sin. You are no longer a slave to works. Why? You Faith alone in Christ alone. You're not slave, enslaved to works anymore. There's no more salvation by good deeds. There's no more spirituality by works. So liberty starts at the cross. And you're freed from the slave market of sin. And no longer do you have to work for salvation. And believe me, that's a breath of fresh air. If you don't believe it is, you're, you're in bondage. It's a breath of fresh air to know you've been saved. It's a breath of, breath of fresh air to know that when you believed in Christ, you're eternally secure. And you don't have to work for it. That's so relaxing. It's relaxing to know that in post-salvation spiritual life, you can name your sin to God and simply do as 2 Peter 3.18 says, grow in the grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's refreshing. That's liberating. But you will go into bondage if you follow the legalists. So they've, been, they've slipped in and they spied out people that they might bring us into bondage. These legalists are worse than terrorists. Terrorists have slipped into this country. They spy on us. They look for every attempt and every way possible to be able to disrupt us and to destroy our freedom. Legalists are worse than the terrorists. The terrorists themselves are religious fanatics. And uh, believers who are legalists are worse than the terrorists because they've been exposed to the gospel, believed it, and now have went away from it. So they are worse than worse than. And they are enemies of the cross even though they believed in Christ because they keep adding things to it. And they try to take away your freedom. You can't do this and that and be saved. Oh, he can't be a Christian. I saw what he was doing this weekend, etc. And they put people into bondage. We're not to be in bondage. We are to be free under liberty. And besides, we are royal priests. We represent ourselves before God. We don't need anybody telling us what to do. Maybe we are out of line. We don't need anybody telling us we're out of line it's between you and God. You're a priest and you represent yourself before God. So what little freedom we have left, the terrorists are trying to take, and what freedom a believer has who believes in grace, there will be legalists trying to take it away. So don't be a coward and don't be a traitor. That's what it means. Don't surrender your liberty. Don't surrender your liberty to these legalists. If you do, you might as well surrender your crown and everything else. So 2.5. Galatians 2.5. But we did not surrender to them. This is Paul and the uh, contingency with him, including Titus. But we did not surrender to them for one moment. I believe you have for one hour. But we did not surrender to them legalists for one moment 
so that the truth of the gospel might continue face to face with you once and for all. Meaning he settled it once and for all. Once again, but we did not surrender to them legalists even for a moment. You can put legalist in brackets. Legalist is not in the original translation. It's just who it refers to. But we did not surrender to them. Who's them referring to? Legalist. But we did not surrender to them even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might continue face to face with you once and for all. So he, so he went up there and uh, really laid into them and made the issue clear once and for all. So even though these legalists are vicious and tough, and they always are, oh, they might have a sweet facade, but when it gets right down to it, they are vicious and they will backstab you and they will uh, say all kind of sly, slippery things right to your face to tear you apart and to rip you apart and then they'll go behind your back and rip you apart to others. So they are vicious. But what did Paul do? He stood right up to them. He didn't back down. And most pastors who might know better still back down because they don't want to lose their congregation. They don't want to lose the 80% of them who are legalists when they need to lose them. He's not protecting his flock. I don't care if he loses his paycheck. Maybe he just shouldn't be a pastor and she should do something else. Because what's the use? What's the use if you're not teaching doctrine to have a bunch of people there backstabbing each other and causing scenes? What's the use of it? There is no use. Pastor has to get tough, as Paul got tough, and especially today, especially today in that there's so much legalism out there it would be nice if everyone was grace-oriented and a pastor didn't have to get tough. You think it's fun? You think it's enjoyable? No, it's the worst thing in the world. It's not fun. It's much better to be able to teach to people who have some sense. It's not fun at all. So they didn't surrender to him. And he had to stand up to legalists and he did it for one reason only. Why did Paul stand up to him? And why did he get so tough? And why did he call people stupid? And why did he unleash uh, every sarcasm in the book? Because he loved his congregation. Because he did not want them to lose their liberty. He stood up and said, I'm going to fight for your liberty. I'm going to stand up to these legalists. I'm going to stand up to these hordes of terrorists trying to take away your freedom. And as your pastor, that's my job. And I will protect my sheep, is what he was saying. And that's exactly what he did. As a result of this, Paul was either loved or hated. There was no in-between for Paul. Either people loved Paul or either people hated Paul. That's the way it is. If you think you have the gift of pastor-teacher and you think one day you might want to be a pastor, remember this. If you're doing your job, there's going to be a few people who love you and there's going to be a lot of people who hate your guts. You just got to get used to it. You got to say, so what? You got to let it roll off your back and let God deal with them. That's just the way it is. You got to get used to it. Then in 2.6, Galatians 2.6 But of these who think themselves VIPs That's actually what it says But of those who think themselves VIPs Very important people Whatever they were makes no difference to me God shows no favoritism between people Those influential p leaders added nothing to me What's that mean? It means you didn't learn anything from them Well here they are influential leaders of this great grand church of one to ten thousand people. I didn't learn anything from them is what he's saying. He's saying, in fact, I taught them a thing or two. They didn't add anything to me. So Paul is saying that these leaders of the conference, including Peter, who was right on at this point, including John and including James, they said nothing in the conference that Paul did not know already. And we'll have to look at 2 Peter 3.15. You might as well turn there. 2 Peter 3.15. Now the Lord Jesus Christ had to tell Peter on several occasions, Get behind me, Satan. There's one recorded occasion in which Peter was trying to get our Lord not to go to the cross. Talk about trying to shoot yourself in the foot. But he's trying to get the Lord not to go to the cross. And uh, uh, Jesus Christ looked at Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. 
Now Peter had been with our Lord for three years, along with John. There's something about Peter. He, he was hard-headed and he didn't learn. That's 2 Peter 3.15. Peter didn't learn a thing. In three years, he didn't learn a thing. And so finally at the end of the three years, our Lord Jesus Christ said, Look, Peter, uh, the Holy Spirit's going to come along and help you. And boy, did he ever need help. And so there's something that could have happened here. Peter had been with our Lord for three years along with John and along with some of these leaders in the Jerusalem church. What could have very well happened was they could have said, Look, Paul, you come up here barking at us like that. I was with Jesus Christ for three years. I, was, I slept with Jesus Christ in tents out in the open. I did this and that with Jesus Christ. And here you come along, barely even a Christian, green behind the ears, and you're chewing me out? That's what Peter could have said. And a lot of the people probably had those thoughts. Who is this green behind the ears person that is unknown, that I don't even know? And compared to the others, Paul was a bit younger, and uh, he was definitely a believer in a much shorter amount of time. I mean, he had just become a believer, yet he had surpassed them all. And that could have been a big issue if they were arrogant. And Peter had a tendency at times to get in that direction, but he always had enough humility to know when somebody knew more than him. And finally he looked at Paul and said, He knows more than me. And he said, and he said to himself, I don't even mind. It's not competition. In fact, he advised his congregation to go with Paul. And that takes humility, especially for a man who had spent so much time with our Lord a man who had been a believer for so long, but he had humility. And we all have to have humility to learn things, and that's what Peter had. And you might say, you're so young, why should I listen to you? You've got to have humility to do it, I've got to tell you that. And if you think you know more than me, why are you here? That would be a good question I'd like to ask. You don't. I study way too much for you too. And you say, that's arrogance? I don't care. <laughs> so the Lord Jesus Christ had to tell Peter on, uh, on an occasion, get behind me, Satan. But Paul knew more doctrine than any person living on the earth at that time. I don't, but Paul did. Paul knew more doctrine than anyone living on the earth at that time. And they couldn't add anything to, what, to Paul. He went to this conference, and nobody could tell Paul anything that he didn't already know. Paul was the greatest most astute student of the Word of God and why? He studied it daily. He studied it more than all the others. You want to know what Peter's problem was? He studied here and there. He may have studied once a week. On some occasions he might have got a little strong in it and studied three days in a row and then he'd take a break. You, you can tell this because he didn't know anything. He could have. He had equal privilege and equal opportunity. He just didn't study enough. And neither did any of the others. Now, John did uh, fairly well, but Paul outdid them all. And that's because he studied the most, and he even makes mention of that himself. And that's because Paul knew that the Word of God was the most important thing to him. That's one of the reasons he didn't get married. Gift of celibacy. He had, he had to spend too much time in study. He would have never had time for a wife. So if people had been solid in doctrine... This wouldn't have had been occurring in the church. If people had been listening to doctrine daily, this wouldn't have been happening. They weren't doing it. And Paul's starting to catch on. He's finally starting to realize, I know more than all these idiots. These idiots are all around here and they've been in the family of God for quite a while. Here I am just coming on the scene and he goes to this conference and for the first time in his life it, uh, it dawns on Paul, I know more than all these people. Now, I'm sure it was a shock to him. And it wasn't something he was going to brag about. It was just something that probably kind of shocked him. He said, I know more than all these people. There was nothing they could add to me. He probably went up there trying to see if they could uh, give him some doctrinal point that he might have been missing out on. But he found out they were legalistic idiots. And he had to straighten them out single-handedly. So 2 Peter 3.15, this is Peter in his state of humility. And Peter's about to die at this point. Some of the last words Peter ever wrote. 2 Peter 3.15 
Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you the, with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, even for Peter, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do all the other scriptures, to their own destruction. This is Peter in humility who's about to die and finally says, he lets go of all that competition and he finally says, Paul's the greatest. Go with Paul. Now let's look at Galatians 2.7. We're going to get up through Galatians 2.10 and then stop and then tomorrow get to Peter and his chewing out once again. On the contrary, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was deposited with me, just as the gospel of circumcision was to Peter. Now what's the difference between gospel of uncircumcision and gospel of circumcision? None. It's just the difference of audience. One is a Gentile audience, one is a Jewish audience. The gospel is the same. So as of the Jerusalem conference, whenever Paul went, went, uh, went there... Uh, whenever, wherever Paul went for the rest of his life, the legalists would follow him. But here, what we note is some a, a separation. Two eight, Galatians two eight. For he, God the Holy Spirit, who empowered Peter for his apostleship to the circumcision, also empowered me for my apostleship to the Gentiles. And of course, with the, Holy, the filling of the Holy Spirit and being empowered, that's all through Operation Z. We'll go over some of this again tomorrow. Galatians 2.9 And when James, Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, that is leaders, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to me and Barnabas recognition of authority. That's what it means when they shook hands. They were given recognition of authority. And in fact, at this point, uh, James and uh, Peter and John decided to make Paul and Barnabas co-equal with them, agreeing that they would go to the Gentiles and they to evangelize the circumcised. There's the separation. They, they agreed. You see, uh, uh, Paul went up and said, Look, you got these legalists coming down messing with my congregation and telling them they must be circumcised and I'm here to tell you they don't have to be. And he really chewed them out and they finally realized Paul's right. And so they had a separation. And they needed to because James is about to go way off the deep end. And James is going to say, all right, Paul, you go to the Gentiles and we won't bother you and we'll stay with the Jews and please don't bother us. That is what's happening here. A separation a needed separation because Jerusalem's about to go under the fifth cycle of discipline. And if Paul had not screwed up, it would have been a wonderful separation that would have lasted. And while there would always be legalists going around Paul, he would have never gotten in so much trouble. Never. No, this is part of a separation that occurs. And while they agreed with Paul, they didn't want him coming around disturbing them anymore. No way. So then in 2.10, they, or 2.9, we, um, we went through 2.9, now 2.10, they requested only that we remember the poor, the very thing I too was diligent to do. And we'll note what this means tomorrow. And Paul was always willing to remember the poor. And uh, it was a, an accurate statement that he should remember the poor, but to request that of Paul is almost insulting. Of course he is. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the importance of avoiding legalism and not becoming part of it because it is doubly accursed. And help us to understand the importance of avoidance of legalism because we are dealing with people's souls and uh, when people are led astray by another gospel, that is a terrible thing. And help us to understand the importance of grace in all of this. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.